morning, everybody. I'm Barb McQuaid, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, and uh, thank you all for coming. We weren't sure the media got up in time for a 9 a.m. press conference, so <laughs> we're uh, glad to see you all here. Um, we are here to announce um, the uh, settlement in a case that will allow the American Islamic Community Center to build a mosque in the city of Sterling Heights. And we're very proud to announce that it was uh, approved late last night at a city council meeting in Sterling Heights. So we thought this was our first opportunity uh, to share this information with the press and answer any of your questions. I want to introduce the group that is with me. This is the group that is responsible for achieving uh, this settlement. And we're proud to work with these partners. First, um, on behalf of the AICC, we have the chairman of the board, uh, Jeff Shihab, and a board member, Michael Shihab, and their legal team, Azam Elder, Mohammed Abdrabo, Dan Dalton, and Kate Brink. Also with us are uh, members of our civil rights unit here at the U.S. Attorney's Office, Susan DeClerc, who's the chief of that unit, and Sarah Karpinen, who worked on the case. And uh, I'm really proud of their work. Um, you know, I grew up in Sterling Heights. I was born in Detroit, but spent the bulk of my childhood at Sterling Heights. And I am very proud uh, to announce this settlement today. I've been very proud to see the progress that's been made in Sterling Heights to improve its diversity and inclusion in recent years. But inclusion cannot mean that some groups are welcome and others are not. And with this settlement, Sterling Heights has taken a very important step to show its residents that all faiths are welcome in Sterling Heights. I'll give you a little bit of background about the lawsuit. Uh, there is a federal law that says that cities cannot place unnecessary burdens on places of worship that want to uh, build. It also prohibits discrimination based on religion. In 2015, the American Islamic Community Center was outgrowing its small space in Madison Heights and was looking for a place to build a new mosque. It acquired a parcel of land in Sterling Heights and sought permission to build a mosque there. It applied for uh, an application with the city's planning commission and permission was denied. Among the reasons that were given were parking, traffic, and height. Uh, our uh, office, along with the AICC, began an investigation to look into uh, the reasons for the denial. And remember, the law says, must be a compelling governmental interest before you may place a substantial burden on a religious institution from using land as it chooses. And so we looked into these issues of parking, traffic, and height. Having grown up in Sterling Heights, and frequented many of the churches there. Uh, when I saw that they prohibited a height uh, as too high of 66 feet for the spires of this mosque, I remembered all the time I spent with friends at St. Blaise Catholic Church. Uh, we checked out the height of that steeple, which is 151 feet. And so uh, looking at these reasons, we found them not so compelling and decided to join the lawsuit. AICC, of course, was filing on behalf of its own interests to get the relief it wanted, the ability to build its mosque, but we at the U.S. Attorney's Office also filed a separate lawsuit because we are protecting the rights of all people in the Eastern District of Michigan, all religions who want to take advantage of the law that protects their rights to build and use land uh, without substantial burdens. <clears throat> After the lawsuits were filed, the city of Sterling Heights stepped up in settlement negotiations. We've been working for the last couple of years on a settlement, and uh, last night, the settlement was approved at a city council meeting. We are still waiting for the judge to approve that settlement, and so we have to wait for that important step uh, to happen before we can proceed. But we thought last night's vote by the city council was significant, and that's why we're announcing the settlement today. So the settlement says the following. Number one, AICC will be able to build its mosque uh, on the land that it owns in Sterling Heights on a parcel on 15 Mile Road between uh, Ryan and Mound Roads. Um, in addition, it will follow the requirements of the land use laws going forward. Sterling Heights will post signs and put postings on its website so that applicants understand uh, what the federal law requires. The City of Sterling Heights has also agreed to train anyone who is responsible for implementing its own regulations uh, to make sure that they understand the legal requirements. Um, and so we are uh, very pleased uh, to be able to announce that progress. And then let me just step back for a second and put it in a little bit of context. Um, this is the second case involving religious land use that our office has settled in the last four months. Uh, in October, we settled another case with the city of Pittsfield Township uh, involving an Islamic school 
uh, to grant permission for that school to be built there, and that settlement will permit that school to be built this spring. I think these cases demonstrate the power of the law to right wrongs, and I'm very proud of the work of our civil rights unit to protect the rights of the most vulnerable members of our community. We have recently expanded our civil rights unit. We're now up to four lawyers as well as support staff, and we will continue that important work. Shannon Ackenhausen is here, uh, who recently joined our civil rights team. Um, it's important to remember in our pluralistic society that religious minorities are entitled to the same protections as all of the rest of us in America. This is a country founded on religious freedom. And here at the U.S. Attorney's Office, we will do all that we can to protect the rights of all Americans. In recent weeks, we have seen bomb threats at Jewish community centers all across the country and right here in Metro Detroit. And we've been working with local Jewish groups to protect their safety. But I think the larger point from all of this is that religious intolerance has no place in America. We need to get over this irrational fear when we perceive people as other. When it comes to religious land use, the law requires it and here we are committed to enforcing it. With that, I am going to turn it over to Azam Elder, who is going to speak on behalf of the AICC. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Azam Elder. I am uh, one of the attorneys who represents the American Islamic Community Center. I'm here along with my colleagues, uh, Mohammed Abedrabo and Dan Dalton. Uh, we filed the lawsuit, uh, like Ms. McQuaid said. Uh, it's been almost two years. And uh, we, were, we had to file a lawsuit simply because the law was not followed. However, I can tell you uh, from meeting with the Muslim community in the city of Sterling Heights uh, that they're very relieved today. They're very relieved because the, the, the city of Sterling Heights uh, finally realized that, uh, who they are. Um, they're veterans um, who have served in the U.S. military. They're professionals. They're everyday Americans. And uh, if I have to just sort of kind of give you uh, a sense of how they feel today, they feel uh, really good, they feel victorious, they feel that the, from an American perspective, it's a victory for all Americans, especially vulnerable Americans, and, and they uh, truly understand now, and their kids understand that the, you know, our, our Constitution has prevailed the test of time, test of time. and um, you'll find that um, over the next few years, they're looking forward to working with the city as well as all their neighbors, uh, welcoming, them, welcoming them into the mosque and getting to know them on a personal level. Uh, they're everyday folks. Um, they're no different than anyone else. Moving forward, um, we uh, as attorneys, obviously, we, we're, we're very concerned uh, about some of the video that you've seen uh, at the public hearings with some of the residents um, over the next five years as part of our settlement. Uh, we will be monitoring uh, what we feel is potential um, hate groups, um, and we know that the city has their hands full, and uh, we're there, again, to follow the law. Our, our, our clientele is not looking for any special treatment. They're just looking to be treated like everyday Americans and make sure that they're protected, make sure their property's protected, and make sure that their children are protected in schools. So that's something that we're going to be monitoring over the next five years. Um, regarding the, um, um, the, the settlement, <coughs> Uh, from the civil perspective, we obviously settled, our clients settled with the city of Sterling Heights. Um, it was um, uh, long drawn out negotiations regarding details, but we finally reached a settlement. Uh, we have to deal with the insurance carrier that, rep that represents the city. Um, some, of the, some of the terms of the settlement are confidential, but in the end, uh, the AICC feels very happy with the terms and the conditions, um, as well as the details of the settlement and they're looking forward to just moving on with their lives and not dealing with basically being singled out. And um, that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Oh, one very important thing. <clears throat> Over the last two years, it really has been, uh, it's taken uh, a lot of work. From our perspective, um, the Department of Justice um, has really um, kept, I think, both sides, uh, kept them in check and realistic. Um, so I personally want to thank Ms. Barbara McQuaid's office, as well as uh, Sarah uh, Kaepernick and Abigail Nurse and Su uh, Susan DeClerc, um, as well as some of the counterparts on the other side. I feel like everybody was professional, and at the end of the day, everybody was looking uh, forward to making a better tomorrow. Um, as lawyers, sometimes we like to mess things up, and we like to fight a little longer, but at the end of the day, I feel like everybody realized that this case um, meant a little more than your everyday case, so we're very proud of the fact that people came together and were reasonable. 
Thank you, Mr. Elder. Now we will hear from Mohammed Abdrabo. Good morning. Um, first, I want to uh, echo the sentiment of uh, Barbara and Mr. Elder. Um, history has shown us that uh, justice is always on the side of the oppressed, uh, even if it takes a little bit of time. Um, you know, ignorance coupled with government power uh, can be very difficult uh, to overcome. Today, however, it really is a victory for, for pluralism, um, tolerance, and basic human decency. What we really hope is that the residents of Sterling Heights, um, municipalities, and you know people all over the country uh, realize that um, you can't protect your own rights while trying to take someone else's rights away. Um, AICC uh, will continue to engage its fellow residents, and I've been asked to let everybody know that they have an open invitation to their uh, house of worship. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll take any questions. Yes, sir. Um, the US Attorney, uh, with regards to this judgment and the settlement, talk about the kind of message this sends, not just to Sterling Heights, not just the city that you spent a lot of time in as a kid, but also the surrounding cities that may have entertain the idea of turning something down. This is big in that perspective as well. You're right. I think one of the things that we try to do with a case like this, and a reason we publicly announce it, is to educate other cities about what the law requires. In fact, we had a religious municipal roundtable here a few months ago and brought in some city leaders to help educate people on the law. The Religious Land Use Act was only passed in the year 2000, so it's a relatively new statute, and not everybody understands it. And so we want to educate all communities about their obligations to treat all religions equally. Can you, can you explain from a legal perspective, the city was citing parking, height, uh, traffic. How could you, if needed, prove intolerance? Well, there are a, a couple of ways. For, first, um, there are two ways to violate the statute. And so even if we did not prove intolerance or discrimination, solely on the basis that they imposed a substantial burden that did not have a compelling interest that was narrowly tailored to achieve that interest alone, even in the absence of intolerance or discrimination, is sufficient to violate the statute and is enough. That was the theory in Pittsfield Township, and it was one of the theories in this case. In addition, in this case, we also alleged, however, discrimination. And if you read our complaint, it will cite some specific instances of statements made by people attending meetings and a planning commissioner that we intended to use as evidence in the case that went to trial to demonstrate uh, a discriminatory intent. However, I believe over the past two years, the city of Sterling Heights and its leadership has worked very hard to overcome any discriminatory intent to try to achieve this result today. And so I don't want to focus on those allegations. You can find them in the complaint. I'd rather focus on their efforts to resolve this and to, once they understood their obligations under the law, to fulfill them. Uh, a theme that came up yesterday among residents is that the city should wait out uh, the settlement because of the new administration, because of Attorney General Sessions. Do you feel that the current Attorney General may not be as committed to protecting religious minorities as your office has in this case? Well, um, this case was first filed under the Obama administration, but it was continued and resolved under the Trump administration. The new uh, acting Attorney General for Civil Rights was involved in this case and has continued it. So um, I, I can't predict what the future may hold, but I can tell you that in this case, uh, the new administration was fully on board. I know this is the other side of it, but the city last night discussed $350,000 in a insurance deductible. Is there any money going towards the MOS, the AA, the ICC? Uh, so with respect to the settlement, to there's two lawsuits. The settlement to the Department of Justice does not have any money damages whatsoever. Our goal was to get the building of the mosque and those other remedial provisions like training and signage and the like. Um, the city had its own settlement agreement. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to it, but the terms of that settlement agreement are confidential. Um, the government does not enter into confidential agreements because we believe in transparency, but it is common in civil lawsuits uh, by private litigants to uh, enter those confidentially, and I believe it was confidential. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment further on that. Well, yeah, it's, it's confidential, uh, but uh, I believe both sides are very happy. Can you at least say if there were money damages sought and received without giving us a number? I, I prefer not to. Can you say, does the city 
have no admission of guilt in this? That is correct. This, so by, by settling this case, the city did say uh, we do not admit uh, that we did anything wrong. However, we believe it is in the best interest of our city and our residents to resolve this case this way at this time. Other questions? I was just wondering if, if anyone, someone can address some of the lingering um, resistance, it appears, that to, to this going forward. And you talked about monitoring potential papers. What uh, exactly are we yeah, talking about? Yeah, if you want to jump in Obviously, there's a lot of video footage from uh, two summers ago uh, with opposition uh, to the Muslim residents who have been there for decades. Yeah, you saw the video last night from some of the residents. Um, obviously, there is, um, when you see that kind of venom and hate, uh, in, our, in our settlement, uh, we ensured that the court will retain jurisdiction for the next five years uh, in order to make sure that we don't have to start all over again, that there is you know, a court with uh, competent jurisdiction that can deal with future problems. Um, and what we're doing is we're going to work with the city and the residents and, and uh, with, uh, from the AICC are going to work with the city to make sure that they're aware of any threats or, or any any um, any concerns that they have. Um, from watching the videos, you see, um, you know, there's a lot of ignorance out there, and um, you know, we're hoping that people just continue to follow the law. But we are concerned. What does that mean? Does that mean that any threat or any act against the property or those there automatically becomes a federal case? No. Yeah, no, uh, no. In, in fact, th those terms are not in our settlement agreement. But um, of course, we are always vigilant about responding to hate crimes. Hate crimes under federal hate crime statutes will be appropriately investigated and, and handled, regardless of where they occur, in, including in, the, in this community. I guess I'm just asking for clarification. If the court is maintaining five years, what's the purpose of that? If something new happens, why would this court be interested in it? Well, the court's, the court's going to be interested in making sure that the parties to the lawsuit are, are uh, maintaining uh, the spirit of the settlement. So obviously, the mosque will be built. Um, there's a process they have to go through. They're going to follow the law. They're going to follow the ordinance laws. And they're going to make sure that, um, you know, they dot the I's and cross the T's. At the same time, um, you know, things change at the city. Personnel changes at the city. Um, so it takes time. So we want to make sure that the court retains jurisdiction to ensure that there are no um, no surprises. Okay. So if, if somebody lodged a threat against the mosque, that would be totally separate from this. From this. Uh, yes, I think so. But okay. we would, you know, investigate it as we would uh, a threat against any place of worship or any other school or, or, or other place. Let me also add. You know, I don't know if any of you watched the uh, city council meeting last night. I watched it. You know, streaming on. Uh, on the internet, and it was interesting. And there clearly remains a great deal of resistance by some members of the community who showed up at that meeting. And I don't expect uh, some attitudes to change overnight, but I am very encouraged by outreach offered by uh, the AICC uh, to the Chaldean community uh, to uh, open their doors, to have an open invitation, to work with the community um, in hopes that even if things don't change overnight, eventually that they will, and people will learn to live together in a tolerant society. In terms of just going ahead with the construction, does that, does that start immediately, or the the, the process is going to start? Um, obviously, they, they still have to work with the uh, the architect to make the changes and submit a site plan, and that's a process. It's just going to take a little bit of time, but you know the mosque will be built. Uh, and I don't know if you want to. Sure. <clears throat> what happens is that the next thing I'll have to do is uh, get site plan approval. Once the site plan is approved, then we go through uh, construction drawings and engineering prints. Once those are approved, uh, then building permits can issue. And once building permits can issue, then we can go ahead and, and construct. So th there's a process. We, we've got the site plan pretty much done, uh, but it has to go through the approvals and make sure that we meet like setbacks and all that kind of stuff, which we have, but the city has to you know, mark the box on those issues. So do you anticipate construction beginning this summer? No, but to be honest with you, it's well. It could be. I mean, it depends on on how quickly we get through. You know, uh, engineering engineering prints take a long time to do. So, meaning like what type of steel you use and windows and you know things like that. Um, my experience is, is it's a longer process because once you do the permits, then you have to sign out to bid, then you have to get contractors, and 
as we know right now, in Detroit, there's a lot of the, it's, it's a big project, so it's not a small time uh, contractor who can't do it. So we have to be on a contractor's schedule as well. So my sense is it's, it's going to take some time to get built, get the whole thing moving forward. But that process starts not necessarily today, but now. Right. The site plan, construction prints, go from there. The city did mention there were some uh, things in the settlement, like the height is, will, will it be shorter? Um, there is, so the, the issue is this, the dome and the spears, um, and they are a little bit shorter than what was originally presented, yes. My, my understanding is they went from 66 feet to 61 feet. Yeah, in talking to people as, as, as short time ago as this morning, they were concerned with noise and specifically mentioned loudspeaker broadcasts and calls to worship. Can you address that? Will that be an issue? Do you foresee it being an issue? No. Has it been sure. uh, no, I mean, that's part of the issue is, is we've agreed a no um, outdoor amplification and um, they voluntarily agreed to by the EICC, so there'll be no out, outdoor call of prayer. Tom, Sterling Heights Mayor Taylor said yesterday that if the changes that were stipulated by the supplement had been in the original plan, the mock would have been approved. He held that the planning commission made its decision purely on logistical reasons. Uh, how would you address that? Um, just to be clear, um, we between the uh, denial by the planning commission in September of 2015, all the way up until the end of June 2016, uh, we tried, uh, we met with the city, and we got nowhere. I mean, to be very clear, I mean, a last alternative uh, for us was to file this lawsuit. I mean, this is a, a vulnerable uh, minority community that had no choice but to uh, use the Constitution as a shield um, in this instance, so. What would you guys like to see this? There's no timetable. I think if you've ever had your kitchen remodeled, this is how it, not how it goes, right? It's always a little longer than you think it'll be. <laughs> With all due respect, but a question. If, if the community didn't want you, why was it so important to go there? Could you not move to a different location? I know you didn't want to, but is, would it have been possible? And, and why wouldn't you just... I'll, I'll let the, the, uh, the AICC answer that question, but... Um, because America uh, says you get to be where you want to be. If you own land, um, you don't have to leave because your neighbors don't want you there. And many of the members of this mosque live in Sterling Heights. They chose this land because they had uh, their prior space was in Madison Heights. Many of its members live in the area. This was an area that was central to their community. They are part of the community already. Um, and so I don't think it's their obligation to look elsewhere uh, where they're not going to get any uh, aggravation from the neighbors. But I'll let uh, the ASCC respond to that. I, I think it's important to note that um, over 70% of the AICC members live in Sterling Heights. And not, not to take shots, but I'll take one. Um, the AIC, AICC members have been there for a very long time. You have folks who have served um, in World War I, World War II, They've been there a lot longer than those spewing venom on, on TV last night who are recent immigrants uh, who have been in this country probably less than 10, 15 years. So to answer your question, they've been living in Sterling Heights. They've been worshiping you know, in the same, in the same surrounding uh, uh, cities. So they're not new to Sterling Heights. And the problem is, is that, again, the city's gonna have to do a good job monitoring some of their newer residents who again, have, have some issues, and they have to learn to understand the U.S. Constitution a little better. Uh, how, many, how many members does AICC have? They have uh, approximately 300 members. And I'm sorry, what percentage lives in Sterling? About 70 percent. Question to AICC. Uh, yesterday, we heard several residents spew what you described as venom. Former uh, <coughs> Troy Mayor, uh, Ms. Daniels said Islam is a political ideology to which the First Amendment does not apply. 
what does the Muslim community in Sterling Heights uh, plan to do in order to address this hatred? Let me say this. One of the things that, that we learned um, through this journey collectively, and it kind of came full circle in watching that meeting last night, is there's no a greater uh, wealth an individual can have than tolerance. And, and there's no bigger poverty than ignorance. And based on that measure, you saw for yourself on television last night that a lot of poverty exists in Sterling Heights. So again, the AICC has opened its doors from day one. They remain open, and they welcome anybody who wants to visit their house of worship. I will also add that I've been encouraged by the leadership of Sterling Heights. Um, and there were people who attended the meeting last night who spoke in favor of the mosque. Um, and then, you know, who shows up at a meeting like that but those who have strong opinions? And so I don't know that those who show up reflect uh, all of the 100,000 or so residents of the city of Sterling Heights. I have family there who didn't show up to the meeting but are proud to see a mosque being built in Sterling Heights. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all again very much for being here. We appreciate you, and thank you to all the people here who work so hard uh, to achieve this result.